I've served 26 years in the United States Air Force, spent several tours in Vietnam, and my highest rank is Lieutenant Colonel. My interviewers are Don Byers and Carrie Wren, and the Thomas Nelson students who are assisting us are Elizabeth Gibson, Don Copeland, and Deidre, I didn't get it. Ivy. Ivy, Deidre Ivy, I'm sorry, okay? Okay, thanks, Scotty. Uh, first of all, let's get a little background about your early years, home and school, college courses, and college graduation. So where did you come from? Okay, I grew up in, in, the, in Virginia, just about uh, in central Virginia. Uh, went to high school there and went off to Duke University and graduated from Duke in 1958. Uh, that was in, Ju in June of 58. Then I went to, uh, into the Air Force in February of 59. I, like all uh, pilots, uh, we went through a pre-flight training at Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. Uh, let me ask you, how did you get your early interest in aviation? What, what turned you on? Never wanted to do anything in my life except fly airplanes. Uh, the, the Civilian Defense Corps, or whatever they called it, the observers, were looking for airplanes during World War II. I was about six years old. I attended the aircraft identification courses with my father. He couldn't identify aircraft, but I could. And so at six years old, I accompanied him each time he went to an observation uh, session. And so that's how, I, and I never wanted to do anything else. Flew my first airplane flight, flew in my first airplane when I was five years old in a J Cub, J3 Cub, I think it was. And who was it that flew you? I, my brother was going, getting his pilot's license, and uh, I went with him. And he wanted to fly, but he was killed in, in Germany, but he never got to fly. He was killed in the infantry. Uh, you said you went in the Air Force in uh, February 59, is that right? That's correct. And uh, were you in the ROTC program? Graduated from Air Force, mm -hmm. ROTC at Duke. Well, tell us a little bit about your training after you got in the Air Force. How did the uh, courses go? What aircraft did you fly? Oh, uh, mm -hmm. I went in. The first airplane I ever flew was a T-34, which is a little single-engine aircraft. Then I moved to the T-28, which is a large radial-engine aircraft, and that was down at Mission uh, at Moore Air Base in Mission, Texas. Left there, went to Big Spring, Texas, flying the T-33, which was great fun. Uh, that last, of course, those two classes together last, lasted about a year. Uh, at the end of the, my basic pilot training, uh, we got to select the type of aircraft we hope to fly in the future. Uh, I was, was high enough in my class standing that I was able to accept a F-100 assignment, which was the cream of the crop, and uh, took that thing home at night and thought, Springston, you really fly pretty good formation, but you don't fly very good instruments. The F-86 interceptor program at Moody Air Base in, in Georgia started off with 35 hours of concentrated instrument flight. We made, we went from, we pulled under the runway, went under the hood and flew for two hours to two hours and 10 minutes without ever looking out of the aircraft, made multiple approaches, we would even fly the aircraft on to touchdown without ever looking out from under the hood. And I knew that, and I thought, if I'm going to survive this flying business, I better become a better instrument pilot. So. Yeah, what kind of aircraft was that at the, the That was a T-33 we did the instrument checks in, but then I went into flying the F-86L at Moody, which was probably the most fun anybody ever had. I just cannot imagine anybody paying somebody to have as much fun as I was having. I'd get up every morning and say, golly, I've got to go to work, you know. So that was great fun. And the uh, 86 was a training, for, uh, basically for that purpose, a training aircraft? It was interceptor training, basic training. Okay. We were supposed to go from that to uh, either fly 101Bs or uh -huh. 106s. Okay, from there, where did you go? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> kind of an interesting story. They, towards the end of the class, the assignments were apparently had come down from Air Defense Command down to Moody, and uh, they were supposedly 15 F 106s and 15 F 101Bs classes on slots on course on the on the base. Um, I got a call from our student leader one one that weekend says said uh, Springston Strategic Air Command SAC under the head of uh, General Kurt LeMay who got whatever he wanted at that time and says we're tired of getting the bottom of the classes out of pilot training and we want tanker and bomber co-pilots. 
Well, I was devastated. I thought of, I, was, I was a fighter pilot, and I had no idea that I was to fly anything other than fighters. But uh, they, they took us, and so I ended up flying KC-97s as a co-pilot. That was a, a real letdown for, for a guy who thought he was going to be a hot rock fighter jock. And that was a what, KC-97? KC-97. And what kind of an aircraft was that? It was, it was a, before it was, the jets? Yeah, it was a recept, uh, large, uh, it was a double-decker B-29 in essentially, and, but with a boom on the back, and we refueled with that. And how long did you fly those? Flew those for three years at Pease, uh, Pease Air Force Base in New Hampshire. Uh, I was there during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 62, and uh, I think it might be interesting to change just a little bit. The I don't think the public has any idea how uh, much tension there was among the military at that point. We were just about on the brink of war. We, uh, when I got to Pease, there were two wings on the base, the 509th Bomb Wing and the 100th Bomb Wing. Each bomb wing had 60 B-47s and about 30 KC-97s, so we had 120 bombers and about 60 tankers on the base. When we were in the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had all 120 of those bombers on alert, all loaded with nuclear weapons, and all the tankers on alert. Uh, we had deployed the bombers to any uh, field in the country that had a large enough runway for those bombers to get airborne. In fact, uh, I don't think there's anything out of, out of line, but Logan Airport had six or eight bombers with, with nuclear weapons sitting in downtown Boston. So, and we really leaned forward in the foxhole. We came so close to destroying the world that time that uh, it's, it's, it's just frightening to think back on it in day, this day and time. We were sitting here in the middle of the, the uh, Iraq, second go around of Iraq, and we were feeling some tension, but we just about destroyed the world at that particular point. You felt you were going to war? We were going to war. We were, we were ready to go to war, yeah. and it would have been a, a holocaust. And at that time, you were refueling B-47s? Primarily B-47s, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, where from there? Where from Pease? Went to KC-135s, went to Castle for training, Castle Air Force Base in California for training, and then we came back and flew KC-135s for about three years at Columbus Air Force Base in Mississippi. And that was really where my Vietnam experience started. Uh, did, did you fly any missions out of Columbus to uh, over Vietnam? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, okay. <clears throat> How did that work? The procedure was that most of the time each unit would be sent to Southeast Asia for a six-month TDY. Uh, after I'd been there for about a year, I went on my first TDY, and we, we flew into, into Okinawa at, at Kadena Air Base, and uh, our, our mission there primarily was to support the bombers coming out of Guam. We would launch in the middle of the night, go down, fly down to right off the west coast of the Philippines, uh, refuel the bombers. We'd offload approximately 100,000 pounds of fuel to each of the bombers. Then we'd clear the track and return to Kadena. The bombers would proceed on into Vietnam, drop their bombs, and come back. Uh, their missions were about 12 hours. Our missions were about four and a half to five hours. Their missions were about 12 hours. But after, the, after they had dropped their bombs, they would fly all the way back to Guam. And we would also have some post-strike aircraft out there just west of the Philippines to pick them up in case they had a fuel problem. And what, what, what year was this? What time span? Uh, that must have been uh, 64. Six, that was 65, 66. We also, in addition to supporting the bombers, we had a fighter support mission. It was called Young Tiger. And we would fly from, uh, leave Kadena and fly down to Thailand and land probably at Utapau Air Base. And our Don Wang, Don Wang is the municipal airport in Bangkok. And we would fly out of there to support the fighters as they went north. And we would fly right up to the border of, of North Vietnam and, and refuel the fighters. So when they, they dropped off of our boom, they had a maximum fuel load going in on the target. Uh, what kind of fighters were you refueling? F-105s and F-106s. I'm, excuse me, that's not right. F-105s and F-4s. And that was your first tour. It, uh, you also you served a second tour, I think, didn't you? Yes, we went back. I was a co-pilot that first tour. I was one of the older heads, old head co-pilots, so I served a co-pilot that tour. Uh, then I ca we came home, 
I went over again as a single ship. I deployed from, the, from Columbus and picked up a, fight, a fighter at uh, George Air Force Base in California. And I took him all the way into Vietnam to you know, just deploying an aircraft from Columbus to, to Vietnam. Got home from that and found out we, my unit had been alerted for another six months too in Vietnam, so we turned back around and did the same thing over again. So lots of trips. What was your unit? It was the 901st Air Refueling Squadron out of the 454th Bomb Wing at Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, you had mentioned uh, something about the target selection at that time, <clears throat> that uh, the, the, uh, the military services didn't necessarily make the decision on what targets to hit. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. No, that was a bad part of the war. Uh, <clears throat> we would refuel the bombers, I mean the fighters, as they were going into, into North Vietnam. And as they dropped off of our boom and headed north, we would turn over their tactical strike frequency and listen to them and see what's happening. And on a, two or three occasions, I personally heard the fighters saying, look at that, they're building a SAM site right down here. And we can't strike it because the only way they could strike that SAM site was to have the SAMs, the, the site shoot missiles at them. In order to get permission to strike that site prior to them being able to shoot, they had to go all the way to back to Washington and, and uh, McNamara and Johnson had to approve the strike before they could come back. It was a terrible thing. Those guys were sitting out there and they could see it being built, knowing that it was a threat and it wasn't a thing they could do about it. On that uh, second tour, maybe it was the first tour too, uh, I think you had some interesting incidents. Uh, one of them was uh, Operation Arclight. Could you tell us a little bit about well, that? Well, Arclight was the uh, designation to the uh, for the bombers flying out of Guam, uh, that was the, they were arc light strikes, the big massive B-52 strikes which you hear about and you read about during the Vietnam War, were called arc light, and that was that was the name of that mission. And uh, any any particular incidents of interest there or that you recall, uh, with reference to your. You're so you didn't support that directly, did you? Oh, yes. We, you, we, you, we, that was our primary support. We either supported the Arclight mission uh, flying out of Kadena, or we went okay. down to Thailand and supported the, uh, the fighters. That okay. was called Young Tiger down there. Okay. And when you say support, you're talking about refueling? Refueling. Refueling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, several, several incidents took place, I think, during your, your tours in Vietnam or your support for Vietnam. Um, you talked about one time when there was a downwind takeoff. Uh, what were the details on that? That was pretty interesting. That was the first tour when I was a, I was a co-pilot. We were taxiing out to take off for a post-strike. We were going to refuel the, the fighters as they were on a post-strike mission coming out of North Vietnam. And we taxied to the end of the runway. There was another guy out of our squadron right in front of us in his airplane. And of course, I was a co-pilot sitting in the right seat, had the window open, and because uh, it was terribly hot, temperatures 100 degrees or so. And I heard this tremendous explosion. And I looked, and when I looked, by the time I had looked at it, there was this large piece of metal flying through the air. And I thought the battery, we had a large battery located inside the aircraft, and I thought that had exploded. It turned out that the, uh, one of the tires had blown up, and it had blown a huge section out of the trailing edge of the flaps, which were down getting ready for takeoff. Well, we had post-strike. The guys were coming out. They had to have fuel. And he had completely blocked the runway. He couldn't move. So we turned around and went to the other end of the runway and made a downwind takeoff. Now, I was a co-pilot. My job was to compute the fuel and compute the loads and make sure we could get the airborne. And my boss was saying, as we were going down the runway about 40 miles an hour trying to get down to take off, had about a mile and a half to go. He said, can we make it? And I said, the book said we can make it. So he says, we're going to go. Well, we rolled on the runway and added power. and. We had a slight tailwind, you don't know how much, the temperature was awfully high, and we rolled the entire length of the runway, and when we got to about 1,000 feet left on the runway, we had decided we had to get this thing airborne. We didn't have the speed, that really quite the speed that we would like to have had, but uh, it was that or go, go through the end of it. So we rotated, rolled down, and we, we took off over the, off of the overrun and went up, and we dragged that airplane for several miles, literally, well, the palm trees were out there, and they were big and tall, and this, we, they said that the spirits lived in the palm trees. Well, there were no spirits left after we finished, because we scared them out of there, because there's no chance they could have stayed there. But it was quite a, quite a, it was a, it was a very hairy experience to go across the trees like that. Another time, another, another tanker landed with its boom still dragging yeah. on the runway. 
Yeah, as we came in to land after a flight, the responsibility of the boom operator was to make sure the boom was up and latched. For some reason, one of the crews came back and his boom was not latched. And uh, after he touched down, the boom came down on the runway and it started to drag. Well, the boom was about yay big, full of fuel, but because that's what we drained out. And well, it, it did fine until it, it dragged the end off of that boom and then the fuel started to run out and just leave a whole stream of fuel all the way down the runway. Uh, the crew, I talked to them later, and they said that they could hear their tower going, da, la, 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 ta, fire, la, 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 fire. That's the only thing they could understand. They said, gee, we don't know what's going on. They didn't have any idea what the problem was. But they cleared the runway at the first available slot. But the fire had, had started down there and was burning its way right down that stream of fuel, which ran all the way down the runway. The, uh, there happened to be a, a Goonie Bird, a DC-3, sitting right next to it, which was the embassy bird that the crew chief was out working on the aircraft. He saw what was happening. He grabbed a fire bottle, ran over, and straddled that line of fuel and kept the, fuel at, kept the fire at bay until the fire truck got there. Otherwise, that 135 would have just blown up. And uh, so happened to General Hunter Harris, who was the 6th Air Force commander, was on the base that day. Then this was Bangkok International. This is Don Wang. This is downtown, well, right outside of Bangkok. But he happened to be there that day. And he gave that young troop uh, Airman's Medal on the spot because he had done a superb job. One of the most heroic things I ever saw to stand there and with a fire bottle keeping that fire at bay is just a, an amazing feat. Another mission you were flying, it was an unusual mission for you, I think. You were uh, doing some kind of electronic work. It, it was hours and hours spent in, in the soup. Yeah, we had a couple of airplanes on the base uh, that had uh, very powerful radio transmitters in the back of them. And you, your function at that time was to take off and fly at a loiter speed as slow, I mean, as, as fuel efficient as you could possibly keep it. What did you want it to be? You wanted it to be airborne as long as possible because any time the North Vietnamese launched the MiGs or launched any kind of aircraft uh, became a threat, this big radio transmitter sent out this information on guard so that everybody guard is the emergency radio transmission frequency, so that everybody in the area was able to hear it. So we took off, uh, this was from Thailand, uh, flew across Laos and Vietnam and out into the Gulf of Tonkin and went up and orbited for about 10 hours. I can't tell you exactly. You've got to remember everything I'm telling you now has got 35 years of aging, so it may not be pre exactly precise. But about 10 hours we went up and it was in the soup. We, couldn't, we never could see, it, see anything at all. Uh, the navigator's job was to keep us we, right between the coast of Vietnam. We had to m maintain 18 miles away because that was the range of their SAMs, and 18 miles away from Hanoi Island, no, Hainan Island, which was a, north, was a Chinese isle held island, and we had to stay out of both of their, their SAM range. So we loitered there for hours and hours and hours, and finally turned around and went on back into Thailand. And as I started to come back, uh, been flying the airplane for a good while now, and had a pretty good feel for the way the airplane should feel. And as we started to penetrate, uh, I just didn't, our job was to calculate, we calculated our, our speed for landing by the weight of the aircraft. And uh, we calculated it, and it just didn't seem right to me. So I arbitrarily turned around to my co-pilot, Brad Grimms, and I said, Brad, I'm going to add 20 knots to everything, because I don't know what's wrong with this airplane. Just doesn't feel right. We landed, no problem at all turned off the runway, pulled into the parking spot. And as we did, the crew chief just looked at us and shook his head because he was standing out there parking us. When I climbed out of the aircraft, I looked, and the whole ramp is covered with ice. Just, I would say, thousands of pounds of ice. I have no idea how much it was. But what had happened, because we had been in this loiter speed, there had been no wind, no uh, uh, surface heating to keep the ice off the aircraft. And this ice had just built up for hours and hours and hours. And uh, it was all coated on the bottom of the aircraft. I hadn't added the extra airspeed and had just felt, didn't know what it was, but just felt like it was time to do something. Uh, we were probably crashed and burned because we were we just very much overweight coming into land. Well, I think we should transition to your, your next major tour in Vietnam as a forward air controller, is that right? Yep. And uh, tell us a little bit how that happened. and. Uh, uh, how you got there, and then the interesting things you did when you were there. 
Uh, got a call from a squadron officer one morning in, 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 at Columbus, and he said, Springston, come down here, and I've got an assignment for you. And so I went down, and uh, he said, you're going to be a forward air controller in Vietnam. And forward air controller is kind of a sporty job. Uh, I wasn't real enthusiastic about that. I had a wife and two kids, and I, I, that sounded like a little bit more dangerous job than I wanted, but that's what we did. So they sent me, I hadn't flown fighters in a long time, so they sent me to Davis-Monthan Air Force Base, where I had to be checked out to be a, be a fighter pilot. Uh, got it there and flew the T-33 again after, after many years. They, had, they put a machine guns in the nose of it and put some rocket launchers under the wings and little bomb pods. And so I got to go play fun. It was the most fun you could ever imagine, just shooting, shooting guns and dropping bombs and shooting rockets. So after that, uh, uh, went to a couple more spots en route and then uh, headed to Vietnam. Uh, arriving in Vietnam for Thanksgiving Day, my first meal in country was Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, 1960-68, and uh, I was down at uh, Benoit, which is just outside of Saigon, and uh, that night I experienced my first rocket attack, and if you're a nuke guy in country and you get your first rocket attack, believe me, the adrenaline pumps real well. They, uh, we lived in hooches, which were just open place, open uh, huts that were surrounded with uh, plywood and, and screen wire, and, but outside of our Outside of a hooch, there was a, a hole in the ground with sandbags around it that I noted as I came in. Well, that first night, it was about midnight, the rocket started to land, and I dove in that hole. There was mud in the bottom of it, but I really didn't care. I didn't know whether there was a snake in it, but I really didn't care either. I'd take my chance with the snake over, that, over the rocket. So we had my first, first rocket attack the first day I was in country. Uh, it often happened, I think, when you were, <clears throat> say, say, having a steak dinner at the officers' club that... <laughs> You had a little pyrotechnic show. Uh, do you recall one of those? Yeah, I left Benoit and went up to, to Fan Rang, which was about halfway up the uh, Fan Rang Air Base, which was about halfway up the Vietnam, South Vietnamese Peninsula. And that's where we did our in-country checkout. Uh, I ran into an old friend of mine from Columbus. Uh, his name was Phil Petroni, and he invited me to have a, come up to the club that night and have a, have a bite to eat with him. So I went up. And it was, it was just unreal situation. We were sitting up on a hill, beautiful, beautiful hill, sitting about maybe three or 400 feet above the level of the base, looking out over the South China Sea and the base down below us. And the F-100s were returning from their fights, flights. And uh, there was some not real smart uh, VC sitting out there with a, with a rifle or a gun. The VC? Viet Cong sitting off the end of the runway shooting at the F-100s. And he was, was not real smart because he was, had tracers. So we'd see these tracers going up shooting at this, this F-100. Uh, the, the, the U.S. forces lobbed mortars in there. And then just a little bit later, uh, they had a what they call Puff the Magic Dragon. They had a, a Goonie Bird, a DC-3, that had a Gatling gun in the back of it. And they would go and fly around, and they could put down a stream of firepower on that spot like you've never seen. And we sat there, we were eating our steaks and eating our salads, and we watched this whole war going on right in front of us. It was just, it was like being sitting in a movie, and, uh, but it was real. There were really people getting hurt out there, and we were just sitting there eating our steaks. Never could imagine such a thing would happen. Where were you assigned, your actual <clears throat> station after you, your checkout as a forward air controller? Uh, what outfit were you assigned to and where were they located? Okay, I left uh, <clears throat> Van Rang and went up to Da Nang, and Da Nang is the, uh, in the I-Corps, which is the northern part of Vietnam. I uh, spent a, about a week there. Then I went down to my final assignment, which was the uh, 198th Light Infra Infantry Brigade of the AmeriCal Division that was located at Chu Lai. The, the 198th's responsibility was to protect the perimeters of uh, the Chu Lai Marine Air Base. Uh, I flew down in a 123 and landed and was met by one of the sergeants who worked with us. And he said, come on, sir, we'll take you out and we'll show you where you're going to live. Well, I was pretty new in country and it was a kind of a sporty experience. We went out of the front gate of uh, Chu Lai through all the perimeter guards. It looks just like they do the entrance of the bases these days, all barbed wire and this kind of stuff. We turned and drove about, a, oh, maybe three miles south on Highway 1. 
there sitting on our right is a, is a, uh, a hill which the army had taken over and then the army in their infinite wisdom takes a bulldozer and bulldozes the top off of it and makes a level spot on top and uh, we jokingly said it was either mud uh, and for 15 seconds it was reasonable or it was dust. It was never anything in between. You know, we lived on there. And we lived out there. It was, it was outside. It was uh, vulnerable to the VC. It was, uh, it was actually a war zone. I was, I was literally in the middle of a war at that time. And, and what was the, what did you call that uh, uh, place you were operating from? It had a... Okay, yeah. It was called LZ Landing Zone Bayonet. But it was a brigade headquarters for the uh, 198th Light Infantry Brigade. We had five facts on the hill, uh, five forward air controllers, and uh, our job was to stay airborne during all daylight hours. We kept an airplane day airborne during all the daylight hours at Chula. So at that time, it was, it was strictly day uh, daytime? Well, no we night. flew some at night, but we only flew at night if we had a specific fire mission. But we put an airplane in the air at sunrise or before, and we put the last airplane back on the ground at, at dark. Mm -hmm. Don, were you taking enemy fire most of this time? Were you on enemy fire? Uh, I was shot at a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a little trick that the VC never learned. We never flew the airplane straight. For anybody that flies, uh, you always try to fly the airplane trimmed up so you're going in a straight line. Well, we learned very early that the VC didn't know much about flying airplanes. So we would crank in about two full turns of right rudder or left rudder. So we didn't go straight. If we wanted to go from here to, to your place, we would fly either with the airplane pointing in this direction or the airplane pointing in this direction. And the guy sitting on the ground didn't know much about airplanes. He's going to shoot in front of the airplane because that's the thing. he thinks that's the direction we're turning. We're not going that way. We're going this way. So we flew like that all the time. It was just a standard procedure. But it, uh, but we did get shot at frequently. What, what was life like generally at uh, landing zone bayonet? Uh, you were in, in the combat zone, and uh, how did that affect your Yeah, day -day? We, were, we, we were literally in the war zone. Uh, there, was a, there was a threat every day, every hour, of the, the VC coming through, the, coming through the, uh, the perimeter. In fact, when I got there, the young sergeant was briefing me as we went out there, and he said, you'll find that all of the, almost all of the Army officers are, are still talking about an incident which happened just a few nights ago. Uh, the VC had apparently come through the perimeter, about three of them, uh, early, uh, sat down, and we know that because they smoked cigarettes, and they left their cigarette butts laying under there, and they sat there for a for probably several hours until the middle of the night. And then they started going right down the line of hooches where the officers lived, where there were five officers' hooches on the top of the hill, and uh, they would throw satchel charges in the hooches. Uh, I, I'm relaying this as it was told to me. I didn't see it. But two, two instances, one of them we had a uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel who was the operations officer, really a popular guy. He was a black fellow, and he, was, he said he, he heard the first shot he got up and he ran out the back door, and when he got out the back door there, right in, almost right in front of him, was one of these VC. And he said, I have on my camouflage underwear, and he said, my skin was black, and it was dark, and man, I didn't smile, and I, and I didn't open my eyes, because I, that, he couldn't possibly see me. So he, he told that story over and over again, cause he, but that, that VC didn't survive. That VC uh, departed after that. And, uh, what kind of um, area did you cover? You, you were only one of uh, several um, light aircraft that were operating to, to yeah. do this uh, mission. It was a, we had a, essentially an area of 25 by 20, 20 by 25 miles right along the coast. Uh, we, that was the brigade portion that surrounded July Marine Air Base. Uh, like I said, we kept somebody airborne every minute of every day, as long as it was daylight. And we got to know that area just like the palm of our hand. We were able to watch the people move. We knew if there was anything unusual going on, if, they, uh, if somebody moved something or if somebody uh, changed something in the area. If people didn't flow like we normally expected them to flow, there was usually a reason. And that, that reason was usually the Vietnamese, Viet Cong. 
So your, your mission there then, what, what was your specific mission if you saw something that was unusual? If we saw area? something, we either got the Army to go in and investigate it, or we watched it very closely to see if anything changed. It was just, we, our job was to completely monitor that area at all times. And it seems strange now, but it was an unusual day when I flew and did not put in a series of airstrikes. The airstrikes were not the exception, they were the rule. Uh, very often I'd put in three or four different airstrikes in my three or four different hours at a time. And when you say your airstrikes, this was, uh, you were actually controlling the, uh, the fighter bombers. Yeah, the fighters. We, we, fighters. we worked with the Marines, we worked with the uh, Air Force, and uh, we worked some with the Navy, not a whole lot with the Navy. And so you were in, how did, how did you communicate with the, uh, with the strike aircraft? Okay. The little airplane I flew was a Cessna Skymaster, the O2. It was a design for civilians, little ladies, to fly from L.A. to Pasadena. And we had put a whole bunch of radios in it and rocket pods under the wings. And uh, we just tooled around with this thing. I had a UHF radio, a VHF radio, an FM radio, and an HF radio all in this little aircraft. And very often, one thing I did learn very quickly, I learned to discriminate and, and listen to four different radios at one time. Well, actually, very seldom we used the HF. Three different radios we talked on all the time. The Army used the FM radio. The Air Force fighters used the UHF radio. And our controllers used a VHF radio. So that stuff is coming into my headset all the time, and I'm trying to think and fly. And pretty busy boy there for a while. So if you, if, uh, you could see a target, but the attack aircraft couldn't, uh, what did you do? You okay. had to market for them yeah. or something. The whole, the whole thing was that we would have pre-planned strikes and then we would have just uh, strikes which were as a result of, of some action. If we had troops in contact, we would go and support them. Troops in contact was, was the priority. If the guys were getting shot at, our job was to go and protect them. But before we flew, we usually had one or two airstrike planned. That was called uh, either suspected enemy location or there's something that we were planned to strike. Uh, we would go in, we would get, the fighters would come uh, up on our uh, NCO frequency, our NCOs were sitting back on the ground, and they would get it, they would clear us for artillery fire, make sure we could operate without the artillery fire. Then uh, the fighters would come in, they would come in high, I would brief them on what the target was, I said, okay, your target is a suspected enemy location here, the elevation of that is, is so many feet. Uh, your run-in heading is this, uh, you were to come in and, and you, where, if you should get struck, you could anticipate small arms and light automatic weapons fire. If you get hit, you go feet wet. Feet wet means over the water, because if you could get over the water, the U.S. forces could, could get you with no problem. If you landed in the, in the jungle, they, you, you, were, you, were, you belonged to the V.C. So we would always brief them to go feet wet. So if that was a, a pre-planned strike, that, that was how it was done. If we got down and we had troops in contact, which was the highest priority we have, trying to rescue the troops, uh, we would, they would call in and, and tell us from the ground that we have troops in contact, say in this particular area, we would change our route, fly down there. Uh, then the fighters would, would be, be launched primarily out of, out of uh, Chulai because the F4, they had F4s and A4, F4s and A, A4s sitting on the ground all the time waiting to uh, launch in that kind of a situation. So they'd launch and then we'd put the airstrikes in as, as close as possible to the troops is really. Um, during the 19, you had mentioned that during 1969 Tet Offensive, this was after the, the big one I think was yep, 68, 68. Is that right? And uh, so you were basically prepared. But you had an incident I think when you were taxiing out <coughs> that offensive, which was a pretty big push. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, we had anticipated uh, a large airstrike. There'd been, a, there'd been a, a bombing pause because of Tet. Tet's the big thing for the Vietnamese. That is the big holiday for them. So we'd had a truce, armistice, uh, a truce for the, the, for the Tet offensive. And the next morning we anticipated getting hit. So uh, usually we flew as a single pilot in the aircraft. We only had one guy sitting in the aircraft, but that morning, because we anticipated so much, we had a, I had a second guy with me. His name was Jack Dickens, and he was sitting in the right seat, and I was sitting in the left. The left seat was the guy that does the flying. And we started the engines at dawn. We'd been, uh, at, at dawn, we got out, and as soon as we saw some light, we got, out, got the airplane and started to taxi out. 
and I was short of the runway and pull up there and I look and I can see them coming across the thing. The, the rockets were just impacting. Boom, 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 boom. And they had loaded all these rockets up and they had shot them right at first light. And they were just walking their way. I could see them for maybe two or three miles walking their way across the, the, uh, the airport. And they got closer and closer and closer, and I said, Jack, get out of here. And I shut that airplane down faster than anybody probably ever shut down an airplane you like. He went over, and there was a, there was a drainage ditch, as there always was around airplanes, drainage ditch over there about 20 feet off the end of the wing. And he dove in that. I dove out of the airplane, left it sitting right smack in the middle of the taxiway. And uh, I, of course, I had on a helmet, a, a, a bullet-resistant helmet. I had on a survival vest. I had on a flak vest. I had a 38 attached to my side, and the top of my body weighed an extra 40 pounds over what it normally does. I lost my balance as soon as I hit the ramp, and uh, I ran as hard as I could, and I didn't, I, my adrenaline wouldn't let me fall till I got in that ditch, and that, those, those, those rockets landed all around us, but miraculously, they didn't hit right where we were. So everything got quiet, and I said, Jack, let's get out of here. So I got back in the airplane, started again, the fastest engine start anybody's ever done, and we rolled on the runway. As soon as we rolled on the runway, the second volley starts to come in. And they're walking their way right down the runway. I'm running this way, and they're going boom, 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 right down there. Made a quick turn to the left and went out feet wet. And the guys didn't aim very well, and they had overshot. And so the, the rockets were landing in the ocean right behind us. But it was really a pro The adrenaline pumped that morning about as hard as the adrenaline can pump. But we survived, so that's all that counts. Uh. You said you had set your priorities uh, uh, when you got there. What, what was important to you? What was number one, two, and three? Uh, how did you set those? Okay. Uh, a lot of the people in Vietnam were young guys, 18, 19 years old. And I was 30 years old, and I really thought that I needed to set my priorities ahead of time, know what I was going to do, know what, who I was going to support. So I made just a conscious decision that the U.S. GI was number one on my priority list. I was going to protect him no matter what. Uh, the second in that list was the peasant, the Vietnamese peasant. I felt so badly for the Vietnamese peasant. He was there. All he wanted to do was raise his rice and have his family. And the VC came at night and beat up on him. They would shoot the village elders if they, if they thought that the peasant had cooperated with the U.S. of Ar Arvin, which is Army of Vietnam, thought to cooperate in any way. They would murder them, murder their children. Uh, the daytime comes along, and the Arvin or the U.S. forces go in, and it's just the opposite thing. We, if they, we thought they had cooperated with the V.C., they were, they were, they were treated pretty badly. So. I just felt badly for the for the civilian uh, the civilian peasant. So again, my priorities were the U.S. forces, the Vietnamese peasant, and then the Arvin. And I lived. I set that priority. Uh, it might not have been right, but I had to make some decisions, and I did. And that's the way I lived with it. Was there any time that you may have given some help to a group of civilians, or try to do your best to make sure that they didn't get involved in the uh, combat? I guess what you're looking for is <clears throat> when I was there, there was a, a peninsula that kind of projected out of the right, it's probably the most, uh, just about the easternmost point in Vietnam. And it was just south of Chu Lai, about 10 or 12 miles. And it was this, this was a small peninsula, and we had anticipated about 8,000 people being on this. And so they decided they were going to clear it. It was a real VC stronghold. It was right in my area of responsibility. And there was something, the VC were doing something there all the, all the time. And so uh, they decided they were going to start a big operation and clear that peninsula of, of all the bad guys. They put the PSYOPs people, the psychological operations people in, dropping leaflets with uh, airplanes with speakers on them telling people to leave the peninsula because we were coming in. We had anticipated 8,000 people, and it was sometimes somewhere between 12 and 16,000 people that came out. And after that, we proceeded to go in and try to level this thing. It was completely covered with uh, uh, mines, booby traps. Uh, it, was, it, was just, it was just a VC stronghold. Uh, this had been going on for a few days. We apparently we told the people to come out, and they were supposed to, because they were given a free pass out of the peninsula. But 
on a Sunday, I remember one Sunday afternoon I was flying and I happened to get down on the south side of this, this peninsula and I looked down and here's this group of people, I, I estimate 250 peasants. They had not come out. They didn't know how bad the, the, the bombing was going to be. And they had said, OK, we're going to try to protect ourselves. They knew if they got in the water, we, they'd been told if they got in the water, we would not attack them. Well, my little airplane was uh, notorious. When we showed up, generally, airstrikes followed. That was just the way the thing was going. And uh, I said, those people are there, and I'm going to do my very best to protect them, because they're, they're trying to give up. So I got on the radios and called, my, called back and uh, told the people what was going on. They need to get some helicopters to get some people down there to evacuate these people. Uh, when I made that call, some of the other people who were on the ground heard it. And they said, we're going to start a fire mission and, and, and fire into that. And I said, no, you're not going to fire. And they said, and new kind of argument, I think it was the Navy that wanted to start a fire mission. And uh, I said, no, you can't do it. In fact, I'm going to circle them. And you're going to shoot me down if you shoot it. So I don't think you want to fire that. And they really didn't want to shoot me down. But I wasn't thinking real well because these people saw me circle them. And that was the indication that uh, probably an airstrike was coming. And they panicked. And if I have nightmares about Vietnam, it's looking at those people. You've seen starlings fly in a group where they one goes this way and then they change and go this way and this way. And that's what those people look like. I felt so badly because what I was trying to do was protect them. But they didn't know that. They had no idea what my mindset was. And they just dispersed everywhere. They ran, but it was just the feeling of them running in a group like those birds. I mean, it must have been sheer panic for those people. And those are the things you don't like to think about a whole lot. Um. Okay, uh, let me ask you, <clears throat> uh, you had been cited for Distinguished Flying Cross, and uh, tell us a little bit about that mission, if you will. Okay, <clears throat> I was flying around on a normal day-to-day -day mission, kind of low ceilings, but uh, able to operate. I was up in the northern part of my area. Uh, I got a call that there were troops in contact down in the southern area, in fact, just west of that Batangan Peninsula, which I was just talking about. And there was a river that ran from the south of the Batangan Peninsula uh, to the west, and then there was a large horseshoe. It was called, we called it the Quang Nai River. I guess that was what it was. Anyway, it was a very easily identified spot. And I, I went down to, I left my northern part of my area and went to the south, and the further I went south, the lower the ceilings got. And these guys, uh, we were supposed to fly between 1,500 feet was the minimum altitude or below 50 feet because the bad guys would shoot at you in between and that increased their chance of hitting you a great deal. So obviously I couldn't stay at 1,500 feet. I had to stay off and the further I went, the lower the ceiling got. And it got down to about 500 feet, which is really in range for a guy with an AK-47. But anyway. The guys were in, tr in trouble, so we went in there. I got down and, and tried to operate around them. I couldn't get in helicopter gunships, couldn't get artillery fire. So I called and said, I need some help in here very badly. And uh, there were two flights of fighters that were available, airborne. One was F-4s uh, out of Chulai. They were called Phantom. That was their call sign. And the other one was A-4s called Hellborn flying out of Chulai. Uh, First guys came up on the frequency were the F-4s, and I said, I'm flying here. I need you to come up here and, and help me. Uh, they, I said, I'm right by the Quang Nai River. And they said, well, we can see the mouth, but we can't get up there. It just won't go. So the A-4s came up on the frequency about that time, said, hey, Helix, this is, Helix was my call sign. I was, I was Helix 2-4. And they said, Helix, give us a shot. Can you talk us in? And I said, well, I think I can. Well, we were about 10 or 12 miles away from the ocean. And I said, can you see the mouth of the river? Got the mouth of the river. I said, okay, I believe that if you'll let me go along with you, I can talk you up this river because I need you up here badly. They said, okay, we'll give it, a, give it a shot. So the ceilings were down below 500 feet out there. I mean, it was right down on the deck. I said, okay, 
as you go along, you tell me what you're seeing, and I'll just walk you along. So they started, and I said, okay, into the mouth of the river. I made a couple of little zigzag turns, and I said, they, you can expect the bridges. We have two bridges. There's one for Highway 1, which ran north and south in Vietnam, and there was an old railroad bridge, which a VC had dropped into the river, but the superstructure was still standing. So those two guys, one lead came in first and two right after him. They did an absolutely miraculous job of coming up that river. They just flew literally, and they would rise up to go over the bridges and back down, and rise back up to go over the bridges, and got up. And we were under 500-foot ceiling. They had uh, what we call, they had napalm and what we call high drag bombs, snake eye bombs. Snake eye bombs is a 500-pound bomb with a fin on the back, which when it comes off the aircraft, it opens up kind of like a parachute and arrests the thing, and it falls in a very short area. You can drop them in pretty low end. But those guys came up there and operated under that ceiling. Nobody's supposed to drop bombs below 500 feet. I mean, it's just not supposed to be done that way. But they operated amazingly well underneath that low, low ceiling. And uh, we saved those guys. Uh, which Marine outfit was this? I don't know which, who they were. They were just a, a, a company of Marines that were out there that the VC had pinned down. And they were just decimating them. But uh, when they got back, I just thought those guys from Hellborn had done them done an incredible job. Hellborn was their call sign. I thought they had just done a, uh, just an incredible job. So uh, I wrote them a letter uh, saying, well done, guy. You really did a super job. And they wrote me a letter saying, well done, Helix. You did a good job. And those letters seemed to meet somewhere in between. And somebody decided that we both had done a good enough job that uh, we deserved a DFC. So I was pleased. The main thing is the Marines survived. And that was the main thing. Uh, you went. You went to La Laos and Cambodia after your tour, actually in, in landing zone bayonet. Um, what were you doing there? Well, it really didn't go there. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. I, I I flew over it quite a bit. That was a completely different thing. After I'd been at Chu Lai for about well, it was down at May, so about six or seven months, I went to <clears throat> back up to Da Nang as a standardization evaluation pilot. We call it Stanny Val. So my job there was to fly with various facts and make sure that they were doing the job correctly. Uh, in country facts, I knew that job very, very well because I'd been doing that for, for five hours a day. But we call those out country facts. Different war completely out on the trail, out on the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, the guys were flying at eight, nine, and 10,000 feet. I hadn't been to 10,000 feet in, a, in an O2 since I got in it. I lived at 1,500 feet above the ground. But they would go out and they'd fly high and they would drop the bombs. The bombs out there landed in the vicinity of the target. There was no precision bombing out there because the, the bad guys had, had an aircraft fire and uh, they, were, they were very vulnerable. I had not worn a parachute ever in an O2 until we went out there, but when we were flying at 10,000 feet, it was conceivable we could have gotten out of the airplane and landed par with, with an open parachute. So now I not only have on a flak vest, a survival vest, a, a, a bullet-resistant helmet, but I got a parachute on top of the way, so I really weighed a ton in. But we were flying out there, and uh, uh, it was just a completely different environment. Uh, I gave Stanley Val checks out there, and we went over and we would fly, take off from Da Nang, go out and fly, and then recover in, in Thailand, and then we'd come back across. And what kind of aircraft were they? That, that, that O2s? O2s. Two. O2s were not supposed to fly, fly up there. That was, that, was, <laughs> that was not in our league. Uh, you had mentioned one, one mission, I think, where you were supporting Marines on the ground, is that correct? Maybe it was Army, and uh, they liked close air support, uh, and you called in some close air support for them, didn't you? Okay. This is that incident in Tet of 69. Okay. Okay, after they had all the rockets, we had a company of U.S. Army troops who were... Uh, moving between some of the fire bases out in the western area. And the North Vietnamese came in in force. And they had a, a large force that, that pinned down this company of troops. And they were out there. And this went on for, for, for really several days of intense fire. In fact, we went out there and we dropped. That's one of the times we flew uh, night missions. We went out to support them at night there, too. But uh, I had an A a Marine, A-4, uh, 
I directed where he's supposed to hit the targets. The guys that said, hey, Helix, I, I, the guys, they're just about in my, my perimeter. I, 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 need, I, I need some close air support. Well, we were given as close air support as we can. And the way the Army would operate so we could identify their position, they would say what, what they pop smoke. They had smoke, smoke canisters, and they would pull it and raise it up, and then we could identify their location. And then from their location, we would put in a marking rocket, a, a 2.75 inch uh, marking rocket had white phosphorus hit on it. When it hit, impacted the ground, it put out a big puff of smoke. And that was, uh, that was, that was how we identified the target we wanted the fighters to hit. Well, this A-4 was rolling down, down uh, final, and this guy had popped yellow smoke. And the A-4 identified the yellow smoke instead of my white smoke. And I said, and by that time, the napalm has come off the airplane. And I just thought, my goodness, we've hit these guys. The guys have been out there fighting to survive for days, and now we've dropped the napalm in the middle of them. But after the thing went off, I sat there. I just, just didn't even want to think about it. But the guy called me up and said, hey, Helix, now we want our air support close. But that stuff splashed all around us. We like it close, but not close, not quite that close. How about backing off a little bit? So that guy's kind of interesting. He, they survived, they, they, and they said they survived because of us. And he came back into the LZ bayonet, and I met him and talked to him. And very sadly, a little bit later, maybe a month and a half later, he was at another fire base just to the south of us. And the VC came through the, through the perimeter at night, and he was out in one of the gun positions, and he was shot and sat there and bled to death. And uh, I, it was a personal loss for me because I felt like I had a lot invested in that guy's life. And it was... Uh, how, are we, how are we doing? Okay, okay. Um, there was a... At, at the, where you lived there at LZ Bayonet, um, you were surrounded, of course, by wire and mines and alert devices because you were in the hostile territory, basically. Yes, we were. Uh, can you recall an incident where maybe everybody got alerted and it turned out it wasn't really a, a serious threat? That was kind of a funny incident. We had a... LZ Bayonet was essentially a little, not a, not a circle, but a, basically a little rectangular base that sat there on the top of this hill. And down in the southwest corner of this base, there was the arsenal where all of the guys down there, they had the firing ranges down there, and they had every kind of weapon that an infantryman could ever use, you know, grenade launchers, machine guns, and they were part of the perimeter defense. They lived right on the perimeter of the base. And we got a new FAC in, and I don't remember his name. But a FAC? A new forward air controller. He came in, came into our hooch, and it was his first night in country. And we were, it was pretty sporty out there for a guy who was first night in country. You'd never seen anything like that because, you know, we didn't, we would go to the latrine and we took our AK-47, not our AK, but our, our, our 38s or our rifles with us. We'd go take a shower, you took them with you. But that night, something got in the perimeter. I don't know what it was. They said it was a cat. They said they saw some kind of large footprints out there. But we were laying there sleeping. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, those guys down the perimeter saw this this trip flare go off and it goes up and starts spouting off a lot of light and then about 40 or 50 feet away another one goes and about 40 or 50 feet another way another one goes and they thought they had a whole whole uh, Vietnamese unit coming in and so they started firing and of course they had every kind of gun in the world down there and uh, it, it just sounded like we'd started World War III you'd never heard anything like that grenades going off and claymore mines going off and everything going off and I woke up, of course, and I'm looking at this guy, and the light's behind me because that's where all the, all the things are going off. And this guy is sitting up in bed, and his eyes are just about that big. Uh, he, is, he is scared to death. When I got there, I moved into a bed, and when I, got, when I moved into my bed, I found it under my bed, surrounded on all four sides, were sandbags built up right to the bottom of the bed with a little bit of hole that we could climb into. So I had essentially a bunker under my bed. One of the guys actually had sandbags around it, and he found somewhere a sheet of steel, and he put his mattress on that sheet of steel. So he had not only on the, on the sides, but on the top of his, he had his own little bunker, and uh, so he he could he could make a defensive position right there underneath his bed. 
we got a, a few minutes left here. Uh, I'd like to I'd like you to talk about your last mission and uh, when you get back back home. Your, your kind of your feelings that summarize your experience in Vietnam. But first, the uh, the last mission. Hmm. My last mission out there was <clears throat> kind of scary. Uh, I was given a given a standing valve check to one of the troops, and those people who are familiar with Vietnam probably remember the term caisson. Caisson was a big battle which took place before I got there, but I had never seen it. And we were going to go up and put some airstrikes not too far away, so I, did, I con convinced him to go over and let me take a look at caisson. That's where Fisher got his uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. He landed his A-1 there. But uh, we went over and took a look at that and tooled around and put in a couple of airstrikes and uh, some other things and came back and landed. And when I climbed out of the right seat of the airplane, the crew chief was standing there and he said, uh, hey, Captain, what did you guys do? Hmm? When I flew a normal mission, he said, well, come take a look at this. And I go out there and in the right wing, there is a control cable, which, which this little airplane was designed for civilians. It wasn't designed for military specs. So they had a single control cable attached to the control surfaces. And it was an area about that wide between that control cable and a fuel tank, and a bullet had gone right between them. I had eight days to go in country. I had a wife and two kids at home. And I said, that's my last mission. I'm not going out there anymore. Because you get a little jittery when you come home. Day in and day out, we did it. But when you get this close, it's, it's really scary. So I walked in and uh, tossed my maps and my helmet on my boss's desk. And I said, boss, I'm not going back out there anymore. And he said, what happened? And I told him. He said, well, that sounds reasonable to me. I flew up on more check flights and that kind of thing, functional check flights, but never went back out there again. Uh, finally, the day came which I got on that big Pan Am airplane with that great big blue ball on the tail and flew out of there. And I tell you, you cannot imagine the relief when you finally are in that thing and you feel like you're, you're no longer in threat. We, we live, seriously, we live in a threat 24 hours a day for the entire time I was there, if nothing else, rocket attacks. <clears throat> got home, very glad to see my wife and kids, uh, got, uh, had an assignment to SAC headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska, Strategic Air Command headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska as a computer programmer. Terrible thing for, for a pilot to be seeing that. But anyway, I went out there and I think the most profound thing was probably Thanksgiving dinner that year. That was, the, that was Thanksgiving of 1969. I was able to sit down with my family, and when I said the blessing that day, I think, I think it meant more than any other time that I've ever experienced. I was there. I was in one piece. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't going to go back. wasn't threatened anymore. The preceding Thanksgiving dinner had been my first meal in country, and here one year later, uh, I'm with my family in a comfortable home back in the United States. And, very, very pleased to be here. During the course of the time that I was on that hill in Vietnam, actually just expanded a little bit, uh, from LZ Bannett, from October of 1968 until November of 1969, there had been, that we had five people assigned to that hill. And in that period, some 13 months, we had lost six guys. So that's a pretty high attrition rate. So I felt very, very fortunate to be home. And uh, what, what were your, your, your overall feelings about uh, what you did when you were over there in Vietnam? I don't apologize for it at all. I felt that I was doing my job. That's what the United States pe people of the United States have been paying me to do. And. Uh, I came back and I held my head high. I didn't. No one. No one spit on me like they did the other guys. Because I just. I wouldn't. I wouldn't accept it. I had done my job and I'd done it to the very best of my ability. Uh, there were some bad things about it. There were some good things about it. But we did what our country asked us to do. Uh, in retrospect, uh, I don't think Vietnam was a good war. There aren't very many good wars. But it was. What my, again, what my country had asked me to do and what I thought that I should have done, and I did it to the very best of my ability.